A warm welcome to everyone. On behalf of Hazim Premji University, I welcome you all to our another session of Nature Writing for Children webinar series. What do you under the ages of the Seeking Sustainability Initiative of the University? I'm Shashwat DC. To our another session of I'm Shashwat DC, and I'm part of the Hazim Premji University, and it's, it gives me great pleasure to bring this series to you. You know, the purpose of this webinar is primarily to promote the genre of nature writing and also bring to fore the role it plays in raising ecological awareness. You know, through these books, these authors, and these numerous books that we have been you know, presenting over the past almost exactly a year, to be precise, we have been talking about various you know, species, various you know, facets of ecology, which have not been too popularized over a long period of time. We've also, there's a wonderful realization as well, that while nature writing as a genre might not be as popular as other genres like you know mythology or history or those kind of uh, you know genres other than of course nature writing but there have been significant work that is happening over a period of time there are a lot many publishers who who have been writing publishing books on this subject there are a lot many writers who have been you know writing on these uh, topics as well so to kind of bring them to on a platform to learn from them what are the nuances of writing to, you know kind of you know understand the writing process itself to understand how did they get these ideas so the the whole purpose of this talk is to bring to photo those kind of you know nuances of writing nuances of you know understanding the ecology as well talk about wonderful species wonderful you know uh, places so today we have a very unique uh, uh, you know a unique opportunity to explore the uh, islands of andaman uh, we have with us uh, author Pankaj Sekseria. He has authored, you know, uh, five books on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, including his debut novel, The Last Wave. Uh, and he has also written a book on islands in flux. And his latest book, you know, Waiting for Turtle, is a brilliant book published by Karadi Tales, which talks about the whole species of green sea turtles and how they nest on these uh, Andaman islands and, you know, what are the new uh, processes that, you know, they go through and, you know, uh, it's a fictional story which has a very beautiful uh, and ingrained learning in terms of facts and you know scientific knowledge that is there. Uh, Pankaj is also a bachelor in science and engineering. He's a master's degree in mass communication, and in addition to that, he's a associate professor at the Center of Technology Alternatives for Rural Areas at IIT Bombay. So he plays multiple, uh, you know, he wears multiple hats. The most engaging thing about him, he's a long-time member of the Environment Action Action Group, Kalpa, which 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 publishes these newsletters, and you know they they do a whole lot of work in terms of uh, engaging people on topics related to ecology. So welcome on board, Pankaj, and it's a great pleasure having you with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Shashwat. And to talk to him, we have Subir Subir Day, who is a part of our faculty at the School of Arts and Sciences at Azim Premji University. He has taught different, at two different colleges in Delhi, and he's also a research associate with the Center of World Environment History, University of Sussex in the UK. He has experience in archival research, classroom teaching, career guidance, and academic management. But the most important fa uh, factor is he has great interest in environmental history, and he's very conversant in the kind of, you know, the movements that have been taking shape over a long period of time. So thank you so much, Subir, for, you know, uh, agreeing to host this uh, and moderate this session for us. Yeah, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much. So before I hand over the wait to you know Subir and kind of you know uh, kickstart the conversation we have, just one small uh, you know uh, request and a note for all our viewers who are watching this. You can post in your comments and questions in the live chat, which will which is there. You know, just right on the side of the feed that we have. Uh, towards the end of the program, once the whole conversation conversation is done we'll kind of pick them up and pose these queries to Pankaj and hopefully get them answered as well so on that note you know I would like to seat stage to Subir uh, thank you so much and welcome on board thanks Rafa. Uh, 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 welcome Pankaj and thanks for being part of the series it's very exciting for all of us over here so without further ado uh, let me dive straight into the subject so waiting for turtles your book uh, if I may say the you know the very story is very nested in the region of Andaman and Nicobar Islands, uh, which uh, 
is also has been the site for your research and work for quite some time now along with the other places so i think it would be fitting to set begin with a sort of an elaboration on uh on that space uh as it were in the, like the group of islands in terms of their fauna and fauna especially because you know uh, it is not one of those conventional human geographies it's fairly uh unique and different so if you would shed light on that so uh, i think in a sense suffice to say that it's a very fascinating landscape at multiple levels exactly like you pointed out and i hope i'm audible is the sound okay yeah it's all right so uh i mean it's far away from mainland india it's a uh, island system uh, that is kind of much closer to southeast asia the northern tip of the andamans is about uh, almost uh, very close to burma to myanmar and the islands come in an arc from the north to the south with the andamans in the north and uh, nicobar in the south and most of us i'm guessing who probably have joined have a sense of the geography and uh, they almost kind of go down into uh, into indonesia so great nicobar Uh, which is the southernmost uh, island in the entire group is uh, is almost adjoining uh, sumatra and it is uh, depending on who gives the figures and how it is studied there are about 600 odd big and small islands uh, right from half a square kilometer or even a small spit of land to say great nicobar island which is about a little less than a thousand square kilometers so it's uh, but you know if you look at the map they, you can't even see those islands they're really so tiny in that sense Yeah, it uh, doesn't show like that. I mean, the six hundred numbers seems fairly big that way. Exactly. Unless you zoom in, there are really tiny specks in the ocean out there, and it has, I think, a very interesting biogeography. The geology is very interesting. It's a it's a deeply earthquake prone uh, earthquake prone zone. We have an active volcano there, uh, because of an island system in the tropical uh, region. Uh, very good tropical forest. Uh, and a very rich biodiversity uh, on the forest side coastal plus uh, very rich marine uh, life uh, and i'm i'm not even sure if it has actually for example the coral reefs all around these islands have been studied enough and i could be wrong i'm i'm, I'm sure there are biologists and zoologists and divers here uh, but i think there is a lot to be done over there it's a it's absolutely fascinating to be able to spend time in that uh, place there because uh you, you just see so much that is so spectacularly uh, beautiful in that sense and you know along with that there is the dimension of course of the human communities there and we do know the place largely in the context of the indigenous communities for uh, for in, sen- in in some senses the exotic nature of the people there and often researchers activists uh, journalists like me also have sometimes i think fed into that whole thing but you have these human communities that have been there for thousands of years and uh, uh, i mean to cut a long story short one might say that if you look at what's happening today or what's happened in the last 150 200 years the future of these communities don't seem uh, very promising uh, they they've lived there for maybe 30 40000 years always small numbers uh, the classical you know forest dwelling hunting hunter gatherer communities Uh, and then in the last uh, say 150 years after the british first set up the penal colony or made the first attempt to set up a penal colony and, and which uh, of course becomes very famous uh, because of the cellular jail eventually uh, are uh, uh, are a whole set of very very different communities that have come from all over uh, this part of the world from mainland india there's a community that was brought in in the early part of the 20th century by the british from burma Uh, for the forestry operations uh, sri lankan tamils were settled there uh, as, as support uh, to support them uh, there were a whole bunch of people that came from the malabar uh, in the early part of the 20th century again around that time uh, thousands of uh, adivasis from the chota nagpur region uh, were brought by the british with the help of the church uh, to help in their forestry operations so it is uh, it's also a very interesting mix of these other kinds of people other human communities that have brought in some senses their own uh, culture their own background and it makes for a very interesting if very very fragile and very vulnerable system and and just to kind of wrap it up in a sense i've been uh, speaking of this of late and that's become the story for me of the islands is of a system that is located at a trijunction 
of uh, I, I've been I've been articulating it that way as a system located at the trijunction of fragility and vulnerability, and in some senses uh, uh, the, the hard facts of the world as it were, the geology, yeah. the ecology, and the socio-cultural context being these three axes that intersect in a place, and each of these are interdependent, but they are also uniquely vulnerable. Uh, we have a extremely seismically active zone uh, and, and development inputs, if I might just take a huge jump, the kind of development that is being proposed there is very, very ignorant of the realities of the place and that's how we are going to increase the vulnerability. So, uh, yeah, I mean, very fascinating in multiple ways, not explored in many ways. So there's a lot of potential for studying and for engaging and enjoying that place and understanding that place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think we summed it up quite briefly, like, like of things uh, which are stretching over centuries of development. Sorry, there is a mild echo, I think. Oh. No, it sounds okay. I mean, I, I'm not getting it. Okay, okay, sorry. So to continue with that, I mean, when you are working in a particular area like that, and when you are, you know, alive to so many uh, levels of the question, the kind of challenges out there. So when you are writing. Uh, it, I would be curious to know, out of the all kinds of genres that it could be, you chose fiction and writing for children as one of the ways in which you talk about this place. So I would be curious to know that trajectory or the thought process which prompted you to do something like, like the book that we are discussing today, Waiting for Turtles. Yeah, so uh, actually we were discussing this the uh, day before when we had this kind of test run. So I I've ended up trying different kinds of writing. So I began very much in the islands uh, when I first went about 25 years ago, uh, first on my own and then as a member of Kalpavriksh, like Shashwat mentioned, and uh, I mean, many in APU are aware of Kalpavriksh and the work that Kalpavriksh does and otherwise also. I went very much as an activist. So uh, the first kind of big project I did there was a actually supported by the BNHS. This is late 90s. Uh, we did a little investigation project and uh, uh, found some interesting and problematic things that were happening and we took that matter to court. Uh, so my initial writing uh, for a very long time was the kind of journalism kind of writing and more out of interest and uh, a kind of uh, need that was felt to communicate the concerns of that particular place. And I was very lucky that I got the opportunities to write and I still remember the first time when Frontline uh, 1998, Frontline gave me this huge opportunity to write on the Jarawa community there and I had just come back from the islands and we now know that th that story or that that incident that I happened to be uh, a witness to was a big marker in the history of the Jarawa community because uh, something happened then uh, that hadn't happened before and it marked a departure from what, what was happening and uh, as a complete newcomer as a complete unknown I uh, I walked into the frontline office to somebody's reference and the editor, I still remember, said, do you want to write about it? And I was like, I said, why not? And uh, so I started writing uh, that kind of thing. And there was that uh, that passion or the zeal of that young journalist who wants to. So it started off, uh, started off that way. And the engagement kind of uh, also took its own trajectory because uh, I was fascinated by the place. I wanted to keep going back. I was interested as a photographer. So I was doing a lot of photography. Uh, but we also went to court, like I mentioned. And matters in the court are, uh, so starting with 1998, first in the Calcutta High Court, uh, Port Blair Circuit Bench, and then we were forced to go to the Supreme Court in the Godavarman, what's known as the Godavarman matter, which many of us might know. And, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of still going on, that case is it's still a, it's been kind of dormant for a very long time now. But it went on for years. And it takes a trajectory of its own. And then, it's not in your control and you have to keep responding. So, uh, and part of that engagement also meant I had to keep myself abreast of what was happening in the islands. We were writing petitions, we were doing the classical things that we do as advocates and advocacy and things like that. And at the same time, uh, at that point, I also started to write a little bit of uh, an, uh, one article in the EPW, one article in, you know, that kind of uh, thing. Uh, and, and then there was a, uh, uh, and maybe it's a long story and I should try and cut it short, is uh, post-2002, uh, uh, there was a, in 2002, there was a very significant Supreme Court order, 
of the uh, in the animal matter uh, which we all thought was very uh, very good for the islands a lot of it was not implemented which led to a lot of disappointment on on our parts and certainly it was very disappointing for me uh, because i was very centrally involved with of course a lot of other colleagues in the islands and otherwise and uh, it was around that time and that's when the tsunami of 2004 happened as well so uh, that of course was a is a very very key marker of uh, the contemporary history of that island and there are many things to be told about that that event uh, but uh, to come to this idea of fiction is also you know working there for 10 15 years and uh, growing on and doing other things and in some sense is also wanting to try to write different stuff Uh, the idea of trying to write a fiction actually uh, or, or a story started to germinate somewhere and uh, I, i've written about this and there's also uh, i've spoken about this and as a matter of fact there is a recent paper i did for a uh, english version of a brazilian journal of uh, uh, it is the uh, i forget the name but just this about 15 days ago when i write the story of how the novel came about and how actually writing fiction and how readers uh, were able to see uh, the author both as an activist and as a writer of fiction and what in some senses activism could not do fiction had been able to do uh, and and there is i'm actually narrating an incident in that paper so it it's it's symbolic uh, but I, it was it was a fascinating uh, moment of revelation to me when this friend told me about uh, what had panned out and i can share that with you but uh, uh, so it was this combination of wanting to write something in a different genre uh, there was also uh, and i still remember this moment i was i think coming back from port blair after the tsunami uh, i had flown into chennai i think i was waiting at the airport for the next flight home to pune and i was reading uh, the hungry tide and i was i think towards the end of the book and there was a moment when i was reading and i suddenly realized that is this this locale this narrative can be a book maybe i have a story to tell about the andaman islands as well so it kind of allowed me it was like a tube light you know the classical analogy we all give of the tube light actually going off and i thought uh, maybe i should also try and that there is a space for that kind of a story and uh, so i am deeply i'm deeply grateful for uh, for the hungry tide in that sense uh, it was also a realization that I, i was interested in multiple dimensions of the islands yeah there was the geology there was the earthquake that happened there was this whole destruction there was the ecology there was the anthropology and we know that both in terms of the length and in the uh, differentiation of uh, the disciplines as it were you can't really tell all these stories in one place except perhaps for fiction except for perhaps for the long form narrative uh, which will allow you to weave in the history and the ecology and the politics so it would allow for me to tell the story in multiple ways and through multiple windows which with a journal article for length and for what it will expect uh, certainly a journalism piece will not do so that was one kind of uh, uh, trigger i also had the aspiration of you know maybe i'll be a i i'll, I'll become a famous writer or a, or a famous novelist or something and uh, you know it is it is that phase when this english writing you know i wrote this book and that's the other story it took me two days to write the book a uh, two years to write the book but seven years to find a publisher uh, but uh, around that time this is the last phase yeah uh, but around that time uh, there were a lot of this a uh, lot of people writing and there was this uh, sense that okay let's let's try and write a book and lastly i i might just say that the the impact of what one had seen in the tsunami in the islands but i was not there when it happened a lot of metaphorical kind of things of the waves where one saw uh, that the physical wave kind of come and comes and goes yeah of of the of the water but it it, it struck me at that point of time because we were looking at uh, say the histories of these indigenous people and that was kind of indirectly the uh, the purpose of our activism i just had this sense at that point of time that if you look at time as a tsunami for some communities it it's a wave that just keeps coming it does not go back unlike the physical wave of a real tsunami uh, and and we see in in the march of time in history these communities either don't have, have not had time and space or are not going to have time and space 
and i thought that would be an interesting uh, kind of story to tell in that sense so there is in the book also a thing about a road taken and the, whether the possibility of turning around and whether there is a junction or there is a crossroads at which we can reevaluate our options so it, it was a kind of a reflection of realizing that uh, that wave uh, does not recede whereas the physical wave that we all talk about comes and goes but there are some people on the other side who, who never have a chance yeah. well uh, the the very story of you reading hungry tide and sort of thinking about writing something about the islands in it itself is a very inspiring story i believe you know with our viewers watching this would be an inspiring story for anyone who is thinking about uh, you know writing or trying their hand at something like that so but a little more i think it would be a good time to get into the book now waiting for turtles so uh, from the get go what i found uh, the very plot is very fascinating where a young researcher with her young son is going and uh, waiting to watch the spectacle of nature over there which is in the form of the turtles coming over so uh, uh, how conscious was this plot of uh, you know did it come like did you think of it like this or was there something compelling that made you connect it like that no so, you know the, the the truth is that uh, this story is is actually a fictionalized version of something that actually happened so uh, on my first trip to uh, uh, to the island of I mean, uh, my second trip to the island when i spent a lot of time uh, we were on a actually i was with uh, with ron ron witticker and their filmmaking team uh i i managed to hmm he was generous taking me along on that kind of trip so i had a great opportunity of learning and traveling around the islands and we were on this island of south sentinel which is a small you know uninhabited wildlife sanctuary a absolutely fantastic place and great opportunity to go and uh, without revealing what is there in the book what actually happened in the book and that experience of seeing the turtle nest was something that played out uh, while we were sleeping uh, on the beach in the open uh, that one night so i tried to just fictionalize that because i just thought it was very very interesting and uh, i i remember that moment when in some senses those things happened uh, but otherwise uh, the uh, so, so it's, it's not that i i have conjured up the plot the plot is kind of has played out there and uh, yeah i think little bit i might have tried to make it interesting uh, and leave that element of surprise uh, you know which which sometimes i think or is important to make a story interesting certainly for children uh, so 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 typically in a story you want to uh, the three or four spaces that are there in a story where you create an expectation you create some drama and then you bring some kind of resolution which is uh, i think it's a standard format and one one tries to or one i try in this book to also do that uh, but simultaneously uh, also inform uh, the readership hopefully a little bit about the place and uh, what i realized should be also i think in uh, and that that was the story that was the realization and the key challenge even when i wrote the novel is that it's a different kind of writing from journalism uh, and from academics similarly a story for children uh, and i'm not saying one is better or the, or, or the other is better it's it's a different kind so how will one ensure that a novel of course you can you can break boundaries and push the boundaries but a novel is a novel and and you know journalism is journalism so how will one ensure that a novel is not journalism because and what might be the key differentiating uh, differentiating factors in that sense yeah and one would be perhaps uh, not to take a position which we do as an activist or yeah. it has to be a lot black and white in journalism or in in uh, uh, certainly in activism Uh, whereas i think what storytelling does is to allow actually uh, and i think we should explore the grays we should expose those areas where uh, nothing is black and white and i think that's why they reflect more of what the world is in a sense so uh, so the idea of not really so to, to tell a good story to be able to enjoy a good story without necessarily wanting something to be communicated to the audience or the reader if they take some that's a different matter so i think that is what i have uh, i have now kind of by and large come around to in, in many ways to tell the story to tell the story engagingly uh, and if something will come 
I think uh, the reader will take it, and uh, yeah. there need not be a problem depending on what the reader takes. Because, like we were discussing the other day, the other thing I realized is that readers make the stories, readers make the books. Yeah. Uh, authors can write, but it is the transaction and the interaction between the author and the reader that actually makes the story. Because it is multiple stories depending on what the reader is reading. So the reader is very important, and I like we say we respect the reader and. Uh, just ensure that they engage with the with the story yeah. or and stuff like that. Yes. No, it is certainly so because uh, I can tell you this. While I was going through uh, the thing, I mean, uh, coming from where I, I immediately re- to me things were you know certain things were particularly uh, uh, you know fascinating. I mean, there is a particular phrase. I don't want to sort of. Give away too much about the contents of the book or the story, but there is one conversation that you placed about the beach being empty, as pointed out by the young son, the boy, and uh, the mother saying that no, it's this is the space, and you know this is the space where the turtles come. Uh, now, right there to me is like the very terrain on which, for about four to five centuries, we have been debating, and uh, you know. So much has happened in terms of imperial colonial thought about looking at space uh, in terms of anything that is unoccupied is for using, uh, particularly for human interest and others. And I know all that we are, you know, it's such a coincidence that at this time we are teaching a course on empire. And these are the, some of the things that these are the very fundamental terrain in which the debates are happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Uh, would you like to sort of think of that, you know, uh, when you go there com- compared to, you know, the kind of spaces we inhabit in conventionally, uh, is there is there something different that you would like? I know it's there in the story, but uh, how do you otherwise see how space is organized over there between nature and humans and others? Would you care to elaborate a bit about that? You know, I think should be. I think we are all guilty of that, looking for that empty, uh, empty space. I mean, there's something that we. Uh, so that, that's why these become holiday spaces, and we want to go into uh, spaces that are empty. And uh, so, yeah. so th- th- there is that. Uh, I, I don't know how to put it. I mean, it's, it's very interesting what you're saying and asking. And uh, so, empty of what I think is very important. Uh, mm-hmm. And what is it that you're able what happens, uh, I mean, in, in the story also is that uh, Samrat, the boy says that, no, Mama, this is so empty uh, compared to uh, this beach in Port Blair, which is a Corbine's Cove, which is a, the most popular town in this thing. And his mother says, you know, actually, this is not empty. And she, she shows him within those few minutes, at least three or four signs of life on the beach. She, she shows him the little crab holes. She shows him the tracks of uh, the beach thickney that has just been here some time ago. And then there are also the track marks of the uh, sea crane that may have come and nested and gone back. Uh, but uh, I think the so in some sense, why do these spaces attract us also? As while we might be aware of the larger problems and what it means, uh, we all seek to go to holidays and seeking. Uh, I mean, our kind of our set of people, I feel, uh, which are actually living spaces for other people. Uh, and, and so, I mean, you know, friends in the Andamans find holidays in Delhi and Ladakh very fascinating. I mean, that for them is a holiday. <laughs> we would want, uh, we don't want to be here. I mean, we want to go there. So I think there is a grass on the other side is greener kind of syndrome that's playing out. Uh, but in the larger context, this thing of the empty and what you're saying, I think is, I, I one would need to think about it, but the whole, uh, I mean, what we occupy as space uh, is of course very, very, uh, what we think is empty space. So I, I use this example when I'm talking in, in different is uh, of how the islands have been viewed exactly like you say and uh, the way uh, the dominant gaze or the powerful structures look at these. So there is in the 1960s, uh, this is one of the most powerful things one is able to use is that there's a 1965 document of the government of India, uh, which is a plan for the development of these islands and it's been drafted by some four or five you know, expert members. And they refer to the forests as Jarawa infested. Uh, so it, it's an official document, and they are they are actually narrating what some Bengali settlers are talking about the Jarawas because there's a lot of conflict. 
but you know the choice of words the choice of words that they are probably translating from bengali into english more recently i use another example of a very prominent commentator who talks of the islands as a, a mid ocean piece of important piece of mid ocean real estate that policy gurus in delhi have not yet accounted for in the larger geopolitical kind of strategic thing so it's very clear that these frontier areas are adjuncts to uh, the nation state and uh, terra nullius the eminent domain the you know i think this all really plays out very very uh, starkly and drastically and but as we are all part of that problem i mean uh, going to a beach and saying wow you know uh, ntb nobody lives here and i i i'd be able to stay here for some time and uh, but so yeah i mean i don't know if i uh, no i mean uh, this uh, the regulations of how even the you know the powers that be and the, how we look at it is very uh, uh, important and fascinating because uh, staying on that point i would like to sort of uh, bring you to the point that you know we are increasingly talking about uh, boundaries to our territorial existence there are now efforts are sort of looking at uh spaces where probably like in the whole policy the part of the policy also has been having protected areas uh on which you have you know kept updated with the protected areas update for the work on this now are all of this i was almost when you mentioned the 2004 tsunami i was wondering that having been in the you know process of looking at these uh situations and how policy is changing or development uh, is happening over there uh was there a some sort of a space uh, you know room for looking at it differently because the tsunami had a very different impact over there uh but has it that has that brought in any reconsideration of how we look at andaman nicobar islands uh in relation to i mean it is it is it is absolutely stunning uh that this this today we are in 2021 it's not even two decades and i have uh, i have been documenting and writing and i find it stunning that there is no acknowledgement at all at any level that this place this is what happened to this place and you know it is uh, i mean it's, it's a very very interesting point that you raise up and i mean i have never discussed in this way in the sense that nobody has asked this question because for me the uh, if you look at what is panned out in these islands it's almost that the earthquake and the tsunami did not happen and you know what is important to keep in mind is that actually the, uh, the 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 tsunami was very important we know 2004 for the tsunami but the earthquake that caused the tsunami the kind of shift it brought in those islands so great nicobar uh, the southernmost tip of india indira point uh, actually submerged physically that day by about 15 feet there is this uh, geologists across i mean the, the americans have done it there are, there are papers from uh, you know civil engineers and geologists from india so it's it's well proven 15 feet of submergence was seen that morning on that particular island so that lighthouse at indira point which is the kind of iconic lighthouse anybody can go to uh, uh, the internet and search for pictures of the lighthouse before 2004 and post 2004 2000 and before 2004 the lighthouse was if i remember right i forget the figure but 20 30 maybe 40 50 feet above the high tide line or maybe 20 meters above the high tide line today that what that stands uh, about the same distance in water so that is it's, it's like a, you know the child seesaw in the playground one side yeah. goes up the other side comes down so the nicobars came down by 15 feet and the andamans went up by about 5 feet in certain parts So the island just tilted like this. Okay. Now, so imagine the, uh, the 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 change that would have taken place. Ima- and there's a lot of very interesting evidence. There is satellite imagery uh, of pre and post, and certain islands where submergence took place and where maximum number of deaths took place, correlating, you know, uh, because those were habitations. So the Nicobars has only 20% of the population of the entire island chain. Yeah. But 80, 90% of the deaths that occurred in the tsunami, recorded deaths. happened in the nicobars 80% of the population lives in the andaman islands uh, there were there were actually deaths that you could count in in a, in a hundred or so 4000 people died in the nicobar 100 people died in the andaman that is because of this not the tsunami alone 
it's a combination of the shift of the lay of the land and the tsunami now if this is the reality of the place and i have now been writing about it extensively where is it in accounting in any of the development plans that have that have come up you know shockingly for instance uh it it is i write about this in a paper that i published in the epw in 2000 and uh, i think uh, 10 years after the tsunami or something in a defense seminar in port blair in 2009 former president kalam or late president kalam talking about his vision for the islands actually proposes a 250 megawatt nuclear power station in these islands if you look at the development plans that are now being pushed by a number of agencies yeah For example, in Great Nicobar, there is a proposal for a seventy-five thousand crore investment on a port project. That is thirty-five uh, thousand uh, on a port project and seventy-five thousand crores for one island uh, in that seismically active zone, in an area which is rich in biodiversity, which is rich uh, un- unexplored. There are only eight thousand people on that island. They want to bring in six lakh people in thirty years. that is the that is the plan uh, it is that that port is going to be built in a in a in a bay which is perhaps the most one of the most important giant leatherback turtle nesting sites uh, in the northern indian ocean uh, the, it was a wildlife sanctuary that was denotified earlier this year for the port to come up one of the documents that is actually used to justify the port says that though the tsunami of 2004 happened this place was not damaged this was a coastline that experienced 15 feet of submergence so the ignorance is i have i really have no words there is a 2016 document uh, another document of tourism in which 50 i had written about that in 2016 i did a piece for the sunday hindu magazine there is a a proposal for tourism development in the islands in which 50 pages there is not more than 3 lines on the ecological value on the socio cultural context or on the geological reality but there are maps in that program and in that proposal of the palm islands of dubai the dubai coastline pre palm island and post palm island to say if dubai can do it then we can also do it. so i mean it is delusional beyond belief i mean they are thinking and they know so much over there we don't know that uh, 5000 people died in these islands these islands experienced an earthquake of 9.2 on the richter scale this was the kind of shift that happened uh, so you actually triggered a raw nerve on me that's why i'm just going on <laughs> but it, no, i mean astounding. it is astounding the lack of knowledge and the lack of concern and we are just pushing ourselves further and further to the edge imagine putting in 30000 crores on a port project and earthquakes happen on an average once a week in that island I insist. There was an earthquake four days ago, four on the Richter scale, six on the Richter scale. It is one of the. It is part of the Ring of Fire. It is the. There is an active volcano. It's the most seismically active zone on the planet. So what are we thinking? I have no clue. I have really no clue. No. So this is. So there are two things that I would like to sort of, uh, you know, take this conversation around. One is, uh, this is rather, uh, you know. Uh, a bit puzzling because uh, puzzling in the sense that even like we as researchers and interested in environment history and you know your work and others we might be talking about this in terms of you know ecology destruction of flora and fauna and other uh, others but uh, you know even from a business side of things the same concerns can be very well articulated in risk management in questions of possible risk and we know now of so many companies who are very acutely aware of these things and have taken this into st- and while looking at it but of course there is a very clear uh often there is a clear line in this debate where there's pushed off where all these uh you know if you put it in a fictional way uh, in a literary way the furies of nature or you know questions of climate change and their ramifications of it it is often seen as an engineering problem which can be done with by tinkering this way or the other so the lot of even some of the most well intentioned people often provide that kind of you know we can deal with this we can mitigate and still have our development and have these you know 
you know, gigantic uh, visions of, you know, building things and others. But uh, I think right from that, I would like to sort of, again, bring it back to the book uh, over there where, um, yeah, where you're describing uh, yeah, yeah. The, the phenomena of turtles coming to the beach and uh, birthing. Uh, I see what I sensed as a reader over there is how sensitive the process is of uh, turtles coming there and anything that these species sense uh, the mere presence of human beings or the mere of any any difference in the surroundings as they sense it yeah. uh, can completely disrupt their own process. So even when we are observing this spectacle of nature, uh, just for the point of from the point of view of research it can be an extremely sensitive and you know uh, thing to do and to, you know to be very cautious of that uh, but contrary to this so i can see probably you know what you just laid out in front of us or what's happening probably that has somewhere seeped into how you portray that particular spectacle in your book uh, however you know, I would still like to sort of pose it so that, you know, we can have a more elaborate thing about this, that are, you know, in your experience, if you have seen or if you have worked in, you know, there are, there are many uh, ways, there, there are a lot of mitigation uh, tactics that are put forward as an argument of going ahead. I mean, I, I have had some bit of experience in research in, uh, you know, working on another frontier on the other side, no in Kutch, where, uh, Mangroves have been shifted away, and you know I can only, I cannot stress enough. You know anyone who has uh, been in the circuit of looking at it knows the crucial importance of mangroves on being on the frontier. Uh, but they have been sort of the argument that has been pushed forward at there is that oh we can offset them, we can plant them somewhere else, and still work with our carbon question, and go ahead with port building. But how much of weight would you see? I mean, how far can these kind of measures be used to sort of, uh, you know, go ahead and, you know, deal with what happens when flora and fauna of a particular place as the Andaman and Nicobars uh, are disrupted uh, at this level? Will, will we be able to tinker and work this out as I think, you know, seems to be the underlying belief? Of so many people. So I, 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 I know I, <laughs> I think it's an interesting question because uh, what is the right balance? I mean, I, I don't. One would not want to try and see what the balance is, but it, it's not going to work to either go in either direction. So I would rather say that to be, yeah. But uh, so the question of mitigation, the question of what is it achieving, what is it uh, directed towards? Uh, I think is is the larger question, and uh, I mean to be honest, I'm a little lost with my. I'd like to say, is that okay? In in, in certain cases, it seems to be a no-brainer. It is it is a no-no for multiple reasons. Uh, that's that's what I would feel. Uh, but does it mean that the, there are other places which are less vulnerable, which are less sensitive? And I, I would argue actually not, because in their in their own context, in their own space, each one is as unique and as ecologically or otherwise, geologically or otherwise. But then we have, so in some senses, what we have today, if we look at that and then kind of decide what it is for, and you see, what is some of these processes being driven by, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this grandiose plans and these larger visions of, of a certain, uh, maybe arrogance one might say of, of the modern moment, because while we are in the Anthropocene and the climate change kind of thing is a, is a is a reflection and a manifestation of all of this. And it is like you're saying, it's not very easy to convince. I mean, I, I teach uh, a class here uh, in of, of master students at IIT. I teach a course called, I mean, uh, a course called Technology Society and Development. Where it's a per, kind of a perspective course where I just lay out many, many realities. And you know, it's amazing how many of uh, this generation has not even heard of the Anthropocene. They don't even know the term. And uh, it takes some uh, uh, 
just to understand where we are and and to say that here we are and now the world is going to be yours for the next 20 years what are you going to do with it and this idea that uh, it can be done differently uh, but this question of you know same same thing that oh, but we need development uh, it, it's uh, uh, yeah we understand the problem but what do we do so i think there is a uh, in some senses we are at a inflection point where we have to start thinking that that's come in some senses in a uh, uh, how should i put it a moment where some something needs to happen so to say and it yeah. is real enough to be able to see that there is a possibility and when you put out the facts in the way that are available you know if if we look at the climate change and the anthropocene the the great acceleration the 50s and the 60s when all these 12 13 14 parameters kind of start to accelerate uh, pollution population greenhouse gases radioactive emission all that and then suddenly a story comes together that we are all taken aback and uh, so I, I still don't know if i answered your question but turtles i think are very interesting because uh, they symbolize all of this in very interesting ways to me that's what i've come to realize that they're, they're very very emblematic of the challenge of the 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 relationship between land and sea, the fact that they are born on land, they have to live in sea, the fact that our coastlines and our beaches are among the most threatened uh, ecosystems, uh, that they require a certain pristineness and a certain uh, uh, untouchedness, and you know even we being there watching is in some 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 senses a violation. I mean, it's uh, one might write a nice story about it, and uh, it might actually encourage people to go and see, which I, I don't know is uh, sometimes one wonders, uh, but it. it it symbolizes the challenges at multiple levels because even in the normal course of things, uh, the, the the chances of survival of turtles is very very low. Some some scientists say one out of thousand eggs go to adulthood. Some say between one out of ten one out of ten thousand actually go to adulthood. And in that reality, if you then see what we are doing to the coastline and to the oceans, uh, and uh, sea level rises, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and also the fact that the sex of the baby turtle is determined by the time, by the temperature at the time of hatching. So, okay. possibly a warmer world uh, mm -hmm. might be another route to extinction because you might have generation after generation of only uh, females because uh, the eggs that hatch at slightly higher temperatures, uh, the, the if, I, if I remember right, I think, yeah, uh, the baby turtles are all female. So, we might only have female turtles in the oceans eventually. So, you know, it's a, it's a completely different uh, way. So, uh, they, they do encapsulate in some kind of uh, very interesting way the, the vulnerability and the fragility. And uh, so, so I think, and, and of course, it's a very, very interesting and very fascinating creature. So uh, that's, that way it, uh, it captures the dilemmas of today in some very interesting kind of way. That if you leave aside all the development, all the port projects, all the defense projects, all the tourism projects, you know, road projects, all of it is on the coastline. Yeah, I mean, uh, it is such a space because it is, you know, on one hand, as you describe it, it appears to be a frontier of our nature, a kind of a frontier of the kind of systems we know in the peninsula and happens to coincide with the fact that this is also one of the frontiers of the nation state, which brings uh, matters like question of security, uh, in relation to all the other powers uh, within the Indian Ocean Rim, uh, which any day, even within the field of security studies, uh, you know, is a very dominant question and a concern and puts aside questions like cooperation around the Indian Ocean Rim. There has been a lot of attempt to also talk and articulate that, that we need uh, cooperation around the Indian Ocean Rim when, uh, you know, the furies of nature strike. But uh, taking on from uh, that, uh, I would also uh, like to sort of uh, ask about that, you know, coming to looking at, but as you said, the turtles symbolize, uh, you know, the vulnerability and others there. But for, and this is a book for, you know, young readers uh, who would, you know, do you think they would instantly think of, say, you know, where a certain conservation angle might just play out that, oh, if they are in danger, why not rescue them and have them as pets? You know, there might be a simplistic thinking. And though this is this might be a simplistic reaction of a child uh, reading about turtles and others, 
uh, there is a whole conservation uh, trajectory of conservation science which started during the colonial period, which uh, you know, with the creation of zoos, and there is so much that's going on uh, in that direction, where a lot of argument of having uh, many exotic, uh, not exotic, I, I would rather try and avoid that word, but many such endangered species as pets is that we are rescuing them from uh, you know, what else is going around. Uh, and uh, it is so interesting uh, that way is because, for instance, in Bangalore, there is a complete legit trade of uh, all uh, species uh, coming from outside. So a red, a red eared slider title, turtle is essentially traded and is found in many homes. Uh, and people feel really, uh, really, if they think that they are doing something good here. They feel really good about themselves having a pet, having, there, there are so many places where, uh, uh, you know, this kind of petting zoo, which is seems to be the American model, but I have seen that there are pet sanctuaries here as well, which is carrying out, I would say, a very important work. But, you know, how I'm curious to see how, how you know, to think about how this can, how far this can go, because somewhere, the moment you remove uh, them, uh, remove these species from their habitat and sort of bring it into your world, the larger question of what happens to that space sort of takes a backstage. You know, there is a whole celebration that you know this is rescued and all of this is there. There is conservation, and we almost seem to bask in such a sentiment. Uh, and we feel that oh, we are being very close to nature. I cannot. I have lost the count of number of real estate homes now, uh, and their advertisements who are constantly projecting. Uh, their homes as close to nature, close to uh, the forest and others. But where do you see this sort of ideas taking us in terms of, you know, uh, looking at, uh, you know, how somewhere I feel that there is a, they, I feel that I'm, I'm not able to articulate, but I feel that there is a disconnect here. The moment we think of them and we focus it through endangered species, whether it's a turtle or whether it's something else. How do you think we we can look? Can we look at it differently? Can we not take the nature? Uh, you know, can we not make this uh, separation? I feel. I I I, uh, I mean I haven't thought about this at all. Really, this kind of dimension. So I maybe I'd be jumping the gun. But I, I hope that at least this book does not uh, lead say kids to think okay I can get these turtles uh, home or something of that kind. Plus. Uh, Probably in the marine context, it might be in that immediate in instance might be very difficult to do because yeah. you perhaps don't have the infrastructure even if you wanted to bring a turtle home. Plus, uh, legally, it's not going to be yeah, possible. Legally, it's not possible. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, these are interesting subcultures. I mean, let's let's put it this way, uh, okay. which from sociological and anthropological uh, points might be very interesting to study as this need of. Uh, what uh, you know? Why do people want pets in their home? That what kinds of uh, pets people want, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, uh, but but from a conservation perspective and what's happening, I think there there is there. I think from what I've seen, there is also this debate of whether these things allow for a certain closeness and a larger understanding, or that it is uh, not desirable at all. And I think there are there are better people and and. Uh, uh, people who studied this much more to be able to kind of uh, discuss that because whether zoos play a role or they don't play a role, I think that it is a uh, it's a debate that has gone on for a very long time and there is no consensus. And uh, so, if, if if we had a chance of being there in nature, you know, whatever nature means, and that itself is, uh, I think a lot of us has changed in terms of what it is. Because I always also the other thing I realized very recently is that. Oh, I've lived all my life in cities, yeah, all of us. But I've never written about cities. All that we write about and we imagine is that far away island or that far away wildlife place. So, you know, it is uh, in the same sense, we are also, even the concerns are concerned. What are the challenges around us? Uh, so, the, the, the distant and the further away seems, uh, in some sense, is more attractive. But is it really accessible? Uh, to what extent it is accessible? Uh, that access has a has a cost 
for me to go there and and you know uh, there are there are carbon miles and there is infrastructure and there is impact so so i don't know but i think it's an interesting thing that we need to keep uh, talking about yeah so talking about writing uh, i think it would be a good time to sort of see if you could uh, you know uh, read an excerpt from either this one or one of your earlier novels for writing to this can i do it from the novel i mean earlier novels no i only have one novel i i, no. I have <laughs> okay one, one novel one children's book one collection so it's not like i've written too much but so there is uh, from uh, the last wave uh, this is that novel yeah. there is a there's a passage uh, which actually is not Uh, in any way related to uh, the book that we are discussing today which is waiting for turtles but this is a passage that i i really like and it's been a long time since i uh, i read it so whenever uh, we, we readings of this book i always read that passage so i will uh, take a couple of minutes to uh, that is okay yeah but, so this is uh, the last wave uh, this is the book and i mean this is anyway this is uh, waiting for turtles we have a hindi version as well and maybe we can read from that so uh, so last wave uh, uh, there is one character called seema uh, i mean it also seema is also the mother in uh, the waiting for turtles and uh, so it's like uh, i do have lots of seema friends as well including one in azim prem university and uh, so it's like uh, I, i know all of them are very they they get back to me saying you know just pointing out say i am also seema and seema is a cat <laughs> is a there's a school friend there's for somebody in kalpur so seema is a uh, is a local local girl who has been to delhi and as an anthropology student she come back comes back to the islands and she wants to study uh, the world that she grew up in and she wants to study the community that she was part of and it's a very unique community because they have ancestry going back to people who were imprisoned in the cellular jail and there's a very interesting history and seema uh, Uh, so this is a, this is a small interaction uh, that seema has with somebody called ahmed mia ahmed mia was a is an old man in that community and i i i'll start reading i'm reading from here seema mm-hmm. had known ahmed mia since she was a child and he had always been fond of her it had never crossed her mind till now that he might have things to say that she might want to know because she's studying his community their community and you know it's it's like their shared history So and and Ahmed Mia has told Seema some very interesting things about their ancestry, about who they are, and all that. So so this is Seema. How many more such stories are there in Port Blair? What have you been doing all these years, Ahmed Mia? Why don't you do something about these stories? She asked, exasperated. Do you want to take all of them to your grave with you? Grave? He smiled a sad, toothless smile. My time will come too. Ah, that's not what I meant, Ahmed Mia. can anything or anyone escape that he went on a man takes nothing but himself to his grave but he said turning to seema an earnest even confused look on his face but tell me beti who is interested in these islands in what happened here in people like me and he paused for a moment and do you know how many people have asked me about this in the last 40 years he paused again before answering his own question one his finger was pointed at her you where were you all these years i am too old now if i had known you were interested i would have put them down but tell me really is anyone interested but ahmed mia seema tried answering someone's interest does not decide the significance of these things it may not matter to others but does it not matter to us to you should it not is this not like a line in stone as real as the bones of annie and kate nobody sees it but that does not mean it doesn't exist nothing can erase it rain or wind or shine ahmed mia burst out laughing hey he got up with a sense of mock urgency i need to go and see your father have to ask him what he's created you surely got a lot of that lalita's blood in you so lalita was seema's grandmother who was a freedom fighter so uh, there is a uh, lot of hot blood kind of thing you become a philosopher my little one then just as suddenly he stopped laughing maybe beti he said it's too late what was being done all these years it could have been a question to seema but more likely he was seeking answers from himself do something seema he said after a pause make a trip to ross island 
You know the old cemetery there by that crumbling church building. Check the corner near the big banyan tree. That is where Annie and Kate were buried. William Sahib had put two identical gravestones there. These might still be there. You will know then that the story of Aniket is true, that the proof exists. You are proof enough, Ahmed Mia said Seema. I'll sit with you. You tell me everything that happened and I will take it all down. But Ahmed Mia had been right when he said it was too late. He made a peaceful departure the very next afternoon during his regular midday nap. Seema had been right too. He took all he knew with him to his grave. Oh, excellent. So, uh, I mean, I mean, actually taking cue from this, uh, what you portray through the character Ahmed Mia, that, you know, I'm doing all this, I'm writing all about this, but is there someone who is interested? Uh, so as a writer, did, do you go through this in your head when you write? Like, who am I writing this? So could you just elaborate on the process? of that so i i feel uh, I, I keep uh, i keep realizing more and more is that i think we are in a moment where we have to be playing the role of bearing witness we have to document those stories we have to uh, tell those stories or whatever stories we want to tell uh, because i mean in this in this actually big wide beautiful world there is so much that is happening that we don't know uh, that there are some stories that are told to us some stories are, or most stories are not accessible to us. I mean, of course, there are limitations in what you and I or anybody can tell or how much we can read. But uh, I think different groups of people, different systems, different things have stories. Uh, and there is an audience for every story. There is a reader for every story. Uh, uh, and, and we're losing so much. I and mean, we will always lose. I mean, you can't capture every story. But uh, I think there is uh, if one finds an interesting story, if one finds that it has to be uh, documented and told, then I think one should just do it. Uh, and where my writing process per se is concerned is, uh, uh, I mean, there, there's a physicality of it, of how I kind of maybe do it in terms of the day and stuff like that, which I guess all writers have their own way of, of doing it. Uh, but otherwise, uh, it is it is to try and be alive to that other reality. and. Uh, and I mean, I know I, that doesn't say much, but uh, how do you actually operationalize that? I don't know. But I think writing is also a process of an, it's an emergent process. It, it happens uh, as you write. Uh, and the only way to do it uh, is, to, is to get writing done is to start doing it. Yeah, so uh, this, this constant thing that students have a trouble of and often we also have. Mm -hmm. But there's no other way of doing it but to get down with pen and paper or today with, with your laptop or your computer and start to tell and write what you want to write because that's the only way it will get done and uh, i have come to enjoy the process of writing tremendously uh, and so there's a kind of a conversation that's happening all the time and there are moments when you're not able to write but there are moments when uh, something kind of takes over and things just flow beautifully and things you had not imagined actually do get uh, come down on, on the screen or on the piece of paper. So it, it is something that uh, I at least never know. I have a broad idea of what I want to write when I begin, say, that in a particular morning and also depending on the kind of writing. But then often there is, you start with a broad idea and you end up, if not with something very drastically different, mm -hmm. something that uh, is something that you had not thought about. Uh, uh, and it, it, it does still narrate or communicate what you want to communicate because it, it does emerge if, if I'm making sense because the interaction with the idea with the word uh, with what capability it has so in some senses it's I, I let it kind of flow I, I let it to the extent that I can uh, and uh, it does seem to work uh, by and large what I also try and do is, uh, but that's, that perhaps is again dependent very much on individuals, is, uh, it's kind of compartmentalized the day ends up being. So I, I do the, the writing, the more creative kind of writing in the early part of the day. And uh, then, you know, other things take over. There is class, there are assignments. There is, <laughs> it, it's good to, uh, it's good to keep that, that distance between that piece of writing. Mm. And then it comes back with a fresh mind 
the next time and i think uh, sometimes you realize that you've written complete nonsense and you, you discard it completely and sometimes when you look at it again you don't want to change even a comma in that that small piece of writing of the earlier day so uh, i think you keep engaging and keep writing the more one works with it uh, it's a labor of okay uh, yeah. it, 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 it's it's a lot of work in that sense uh, but I, i've come to realize that it certainly one can't force it one can't force that i will write it like this and this is how it will turn out it does have a kind of trajectory of its own well my uh, my take away from this would be uh, your line about being alive to the other reality i think that would be something that i definitely would take away from this uh, pankaj we have some questions from the audience right now so i will ask go uh, sashwat to probably come back in stepping back here oh okay we can see sorry we can see the question on the uh, pankaj can you see the question on the screen yes 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 so yeah so then yeah uh, it took two years to write a novel is it common how much time did it take for your debut novel the last wave or the island in flux yeah i don't know and i i i mean this is a question we have to ask individual authors of uh, how much time their uh, story took to write i don't think there is a fixed uh, this thing and you know i i am i have only one novel so i'm not really in any way uh, even qualified to answer that question because i don't know even if i write another novel uh, i have kind of moved on and i want to write but i don't know but i think uh, in my case uh, what i realize is that the, the last wave i and i'll answer that other part of the question uh, of islands in flux which is not a novel uh, so the last wave really draws upon almost 10 15 years of my work in that landscape so uh, it is so in some senses uh, i'm drawing on that research and that lived experience uh, which in some senses saves me time so when i say two years what i mean is when the idea of wanting to write a novel uh, came to my mind and i had time on my hand and between starting to think of a story and then completing a manuscript that i thought was complete was about two years but uh, if somebody was to start working on a new landscape if i was to want to write say a novel based in kurg or a novel based in uh, uh, any other landscape i won't have that kind of information and detail mm. but it is one kind of writing so why should it be uh, so true to the reality of the place it need not be i mean that's what writing allows us to do so in that sense i had all that uh, you know that that time crunched into my experience which i then uh, then i kind of played out what a lot of people say if, if that is partly the question uh, in some senses to vijeta to answer to a question is that uh, there is a general understanding that the, the first novels of people many people draw upon their experiences they kind of tell the story because it has to be told and it perhaps the easiest because you after that it might become and again this is i don't know if it's kind of uh, scientifically true but uh, yeah you you do see that a lot of people talk about it and uh, i did that too so i use that a lot i use a lot of my diary notes in the islands to to kind of they seep in uh, you use that as material to tell your story uh, i also use a lot of uh, so there are actually two characters in the book who are real people who i know uh, who are who are living human beings i mean one unfortunately uh, passed away many of us would know him is uh, ravi shankaran uh, who, who was a great friend and he actually did read the manuscript of the book and then he kind of uh, uh, that he had his heart attack and he died but he appears in the book and another anthropologist appears so i'm i'm drawing upon that uh, experience and that body where islands in flux is concerned uh, it is actually a collection of my journalism of 20 years in the islands about uh, i've written quite a bit but about 30 40 articles across six or seven broad themes uh, that actually tell the contemporary story of the islands like has not been told just because i've been there all these years even as a disconnected narrative not as a one free flowing narrative it tells you dimensions of that story and the place which uh, like like we just discussed nobody tells us yeah uh, that that is why i think it's important uh, so to answer vijeta's question is uh, you know it, it really depends but it does take some some time to write up a i don't think you write up a novel in a month uh, it, it takes some time because it's much larger you know 30 40 1000 60000 word 80000 words and uh, the challenge of course is then to get it published but that's a different story and ball game completely yeah 
Okay. Great. Uh, yes, I think we have another question from Dinesh Chaturvedi. Yeah, Andaman has suffered much, but is isolation the right policy? Should the residents of the archipelago be deprived of connections to mainland or benefits that accrue from economic integration? So I think, uh, Mr. Chaturvedi, there are lots of uh, assumptions here. Uh, what do we mean by suffered? What do we mean by isolation? What do we mean by economic benefits? And I'm not saying that your questions are not uh, relevant, but I, I would uh, also also ask these questions: is What do we mean when we say suffered? Uh, what what is what is going to be the trade-off? What is it that we are really offering to that place? Uh, and uh, I have this story to tell, and, and it's it's very difficult to say. I know isolation from what? Who is isolating whom? Uh, what would it mean to connect? Uh, and, and what would that connection mean? Does it mean three flights a day? Does it mean good internet? What would yeah. it mean to connect? So uh, I, I think there are many layers of the question that I would like to actually ask questions further of uh, what we uh, mean in, in, in that. Uh, so, uh, and that is, I think, what a lot of people do ask and think about. But uh, I don't think that there is... Uh, is, is, are there some other questions we can ask also? I mean, not in the in the context of this conversation, but uh, what would it mean to not iso to keep the people isolated? Are they isolated at all in the first place? Yeah. And if within the islands, uh, whom are we talking about? Because there is no one island. There is not one community there. There are different kinds of people with different kinds of histories and different kinds of isolation. Uh, so, whom are we talking about? What do we want to do with all the people? Uh, who is taking the decisions? So yeah. all that also come. I mean, without asking those questions, it's going to be very difficult to answer this one. That's what I would say. No, and I think there are also clear uh, indications. Just to add on before we move to the next question, that there has been a report that during the tsunami times there were attempts to reach the islands where certain communities lived, and uh, arrows were thrown at them. And on the other hand, very much recently, uh, you, you know. Uh, there has been a death of a particular American missionary who who tried going there and uh, you know bringing that to a sort of a replay from many centuries ago of colonial times. Uh, so there are indications enough actually to see and to look for these kind of questions of you know the way what you ask you know are they really isolated or what they want yeah. that ways. Uh, there is another question, uh, a more technical one I would say. The turtles, the turtles eggs get washed by the turtles. I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, do you mean washed away by the by the sea? Uh, is that a kind of typo by any chance, uh, Mr. Ahuja? Uh, if you can just clarify, uh, that might help. If you're still there, Mr. Ahuja. I, I mean, quickly, maybe I can just narrate uh, what happens is that... Uh, uh, female turtles, uh, when they are ready to lay their eggs, uh, come up on these uh, uh, beaches all over the world, including on mainland India, including uh, in Bombay, as a matter of fact. Uh, and there are seven species of sea turtles uh, on the planet. Uh, the smallest being what's called the olive ridley, and the largest being the, the giant leatherback, which can grow up to six feet in length, 600, 800 kilograms in weight. And somewhere in the middle is this uh, green sea turtle, which is the turtle in the story that in the book that we are talking about and actually we've not talked about that much but anyway uh, so what happens is that uh, the, the once the female is ready to lay her eggs generally in the middle of the of the night she comes to these very isolated beaches uh, she crawls onto the sandy beaches uh, she goes to the end of the beach generally above the high tide line she uses her back flippers and this is what the story, what is also described in the book. So this introduces this whole uh, sto uh, process of turtle nesting where uh, this uh, researcher, turtle researcher Seema is showing her son. And the mother turtle digs this hole with her back flippers. She lays her eggs in that nest, which, which are round, uh, soft, unlike the uh, chicken eggs that we have at home. Then she covers uh, the, the nest hole with sand and then she goes back to the ocean and that's it. Uh, and then about 70 to 90 days later, depending on the species, uh, all these, on an average, say 100 eggs that are laid, all hatch at the same time, generally again at night. 
and then they dig themselves out. Uh, so they are about four five inches in length, and they are in a pit that may be two three feet depth. So they dig themselves out, and then they go straight back to the ocean without any help, without any guidance from anybody. So the the, the mother turtle comes and lays her eggs, and then she goes back, and that's it. Uh, and yes, so if I understand your question, uh, the the eggs are very vulnerable. Uh, they can be actually dug up by dogs or by monitors and by other creatures. Human beings take them up in very large numbers where they are accessible. There are many communities in different parts of the world where there is this idea that actually uh, communities make some money out of the egg trade. So they also protect the nests. At the same time, they consume the eggs and they sell them in the market. So there's that model of sustainable use kind of uh, logic. Right. Uh, and then there is uh, then there might be certain events when if the beach gets washed away, either gets eroded. Then the eggs do get washed away, and that is uh, then they get wasted. So in that sense, it can happen. And and there are other processes where, where sometimes a turtle has laid her eggs and gone away, and because the turtle nesting season is a long one, maybe another turtle comes and actually digs up that particular place again and lays her eggs. So the earlier nest is then kind of destroyed because of course they don't know, and it depends on the numbers and the frequency by which they come. It varies for different turtle species, but uh, uh, so, so th there is the possibility of the damage and the loss of the eggs for multiple reasons, including by being washed away uh, by the ocean waves and erosion and stuff like that. Like, perhaps that answers the question. If and yeah. if he's there and he can clarify, then maybe. I mean, we got to know much more while you are trying to answer okay. it. Yeah. Okay. How easy or difficult was to combine fiction for children with scientific information? You know. Again, I have written only one book for for children. I, many years ago, I did write a couple of stories that were published in Chanda Mama because the, the organization I work for, Kalpa Vriksh, as I also actually published an amazing range of uh, books for children on uh, on wildlife and in wildlife. Uh, so I think it is it is not very difficult to actually combine uh, scientific information uh, uh, because uh, the information has to be right. I mean, whatever we say, we can't. Uh, and this is complete fantasy. If you are kind of narrating a real life or, or adapting a real life situation, then that has to be there. Uh, but you know, I, I, I would like to say something which uh, is not directly your your the question. The answer to the question is, but an illustrated children's book, I think, is so much a publisher's and an illustrator's product. You know, mm -hmm. I feel as a writer, as a writer of the story, I I get. Uh, I think unfair visibility and credit for uh, what has been put out by the public. The, the amount of work that a publisher does, anyway, uh, and it's important. And I'm not being facetious there because uh, a children's book is a product because it's children. It is to read and to see. It's as much a product for seeing and uh, story. Finally, for, and it has to be a short story. So the, this. Story is only about thousand words, so it's it's actually I'm not saying it's easy to do, but it is not so difficult because uh, with time you can get the story right and people can help you get the story right, and that's what Shobha, who's the publisher at Karani, one of the key things and we discussed that earlier, Shobha is saying that never never moralize to children. That's a very important thing that we all do, and it's very interesting. Uh, just as an aside. Uh, Manchi Pustakam, which is a Hyderabad-based uh, publisher of children's books in Telugu, has just published the Telugu version of this book. And there's a very interesting interview of uh, the team there, uh, Suresh and Bhagishri, that appeared in the New Indian Express uh, just two days back. And they say that one of the biggest challenges that they have found in finding stories is either uh, the story writers want to tell a moral very explicitly, or increasingly parents want stories. For children, which are how to be successful kind of how to do it kind of uh, books, so nobody is telling stories for the sake of telling stories. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. So, so, so what Shobha says is that we don't want to moralize to kids. So that is one dimension, and you can get that done in your story. But this particular book, uh, this story, this we started our conversation two and a half years ago, and the story was ready two and a half years ago. The production process, the illustration process, is amazing. I mean, the kind of work that the illustrator has done, the kind of beauty that the illustrator Vipin has brought to this book, 
it is outstanding i mean it is it, it just gives a completely different meaning to the story so while writing is important i think for this genre of writing and publishing i think uh, publishers because they are they are curating that process they are drawing in the story they they are of course you have to interact because in in our case the color of the sand the nature of the forest for somebody who does not know also becomes important because in a narrative where there is no image you can say white sand or you can say a forest but when you have to illustrate it you have to get it right and there is where the scientific knowledge also helps because uh, to answer the question it's not just about the text it's also very important in a visual depiction of the visuals of the color of the of the shape of of what it is so i think there are many things that are going in and the, it's the publisher that is holding this and i mean huge credit and uh, very very important and illustrator i mean imagine if, if any of you have looked at this book and any children's book how much uh, how much labor how much labor of love has gone into it so uh, it's very very important and i think we have to keep that in mind no yeah, definitely definitely Oh, yeah. Ha. Something that we talked about turtles as pet. <laughs> and, uh, what do people think of it? Yeah, I know. I, well, I, I I don't know the answer to your question, Pranav. I, I'm really not in that space. But um, I think there are other complications because I think, like you mentioned, should be a lot of the. fresh water turtles that are pets are also exotics they are not yeah. they are not in our uh, meant to be in our in our landscapes so, so what happens if you release them into these lakes and you know you're going to change the yeah. the kind of composition and we don't know what they will do as predators or 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 uh, you know foragers and all that so i don't know how to know what to answer your question i'm probably not the right person as well uh, i know this is also actually i mean that's the other dimension but we just have to keep talking to people and saying that they should not do it but i i don't know more than that yeah just actually to uh yeah there is another question uh yeah. just before you get on to this i'll just quickly add as an information because it came up as a conflict, uh question uh actually pranav the saying that this is from my own personal experience i had a one of my friends had a uh red ear slider title which is actually a native of america and we actually put it back in uh, in a pet sanctuary in bangalore because it is actually also problematic and illegal to put a foreign species in uh, any of the lakes and all because they can be invasive it goes for plants and uh, as well so reaching out prani the pet sanctuary which works in bangalore i know i don't know of other places actually does considerable amount of work in this direction of rescue and sort of maintaining these norms so pranav might okay now we have next anita's question uh is mitigation for development is nice to know is mitigation for development approved by ecologists again i'm not sure exactly what you mean but I, i'm guessing uh you're talking about the regulatory processes and so uh, but you know i think that is happening because when projects are cleared uh, there is a uh, uh, the law and policy seeks to assess the damage i mean there is the environmental impact assessment uh, there is uh, the social impact assessment and at the end of the day in that space i guess there is a there is a trade off that people are looking at uh, and uh, so there is i think the legal framework is there there are the processes are there uh, but to what extent they are followed and or, and whether they have become rubber stamps uh, and whether it is dependent on the system or whether it's there on the on the on the basis of certain individuals on how they respond uh so i think i think the lord is happening that should not be happening in in the development kind of uh, clearances that are happening uh, so there's, there's a failure of i think at multiple levels and we see this uh, across across projects uh, across our geographies whether it's delhi or whether it's the western ghats or whether it's the islands uh the kind of projects that are getting cleared the kind of processes that are getting cleared you now rti is being denied because we asked a question a friend asked a question on this port project in uh, in in port blair in, in great nicobar that i'm talking about the section 8 of the rti they are saying we can't give the information and i think section 8 is about uh, threat to national security or something yeah. of that kind so i mean this is a port project where uh, there is a 
a consultant who has put out a 150 page report saying what is going to be done here for 75000 crores and if i ask a question on that how can you say that uh, this is a status of you know uh, section 8 so i think there is a uh, there is you know there, there is the deficit of the systems and there is a deficiency in the systems so we don't have enough systems and and enough for caretaking and enough uh, on the one hand and what is there is also being not working it is being whittled down it is being broken apart in the current uh, political economic climate i mean there is no hesitation to say that so uh, in some senses uh, if anita's question is yes maybe ecologists for different reasons are agreeing to these things Uh, but at the larger level it's also the development paradigm that we are looking at it's it's it's, it's we are uh, kind of guilty of that in our own ways i think our systems and what we demand and i mean roads and infrastructure we all want infrastructure we all want fast moving roads we all want highways through forests to reach other forests and a price is going to be paid for that so i think somewhere the larger development model which a lot of people are talking about which is very structural issues of uh, growth degrowth post growth Uh, very interesting, uh, you know, theories and conceptual work happening there. Uh, so we are all part of that, and I guess ecology is also part of that. So somewhere somebody is going to say that's okay because you know we need that, and something has to be compromised, so to say. But yeah, it's, it's a very really bad scene. Yeah. So there is one more question. Yeah. But yeah, to Anita's question, I would be rather curious to know how much of weight does an ecologist get in a sort of a development policy rollout. I don't know whether they are hired, whether they are part of any consultant team. Uh, I I would be curious to know that. Yeah, that that on the one hand that's true, but you know, finally, say if there are wildlife clearances, then uh, it, or or environmental clearances, there are a whole body of uh, committees under the MOEF, and many of them are staffed by certainly by the bureaucrats and foresters, but there also are uh, wildlife scientists, biologists, ecologists on those committees. how much say they have uh, hmm. how much are able to take a stand i think are questions i don't have answers to because i have never been in one but yeah that is perhaps uh, an important dimension so i think there is another question on the screen yeah. i am sure there have been events of disaster capitalism in the islands where the state accumulates right after a hazard which when they come can you look at one of these uh i am not sure i i mean to be honest i don't understand what you what you mean akash ji when you say disaster capitalism you mean i know that term has been around for a while but uh, if it means something specific i am not uh, whether we use disaster as a way to get in money and development if yeah. that i think that's what it's being pointed at for instance uh, uh, kutch post 2001 earthquake Uh, in that case, Andaman Nicobar post 2000 tsunami. Ah, uh, well, again, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, 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 I'm not engaged with that kind of uh, narrative and things. So maybe I'm not in the best place to answer that question. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Well. It's one and a half hours. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it was. Uh, yeah, I mean. This could be definitely looked at, uh, but yeah, uh, Pankaj, we couldn't thank you enough for being part of this, elaborating on the book, elaborating on a uh, part of our country which we know very less about, and the whole of uh, all the stories, the complexities, and the challenges that we see here. Uh, to our viewers, we would like to thank you for patiently going through this. and uh, please join us in our next session uh, the, for the, where we discuss the next book critters around us by sanjay sonthi who is also a member of kalpavriksh founder of the titli trust and uh, with this we conclude our evening here today thank you pankaj sashwat would you like to step in back So thank you, thank you, Pankaj. It was a great pleasure having you for us and talking about uh, Andaman in such a candid and you know uh, uh, in a manner and you know giving us insights into all these issues that we have you know we we haven't looked at it for a long time. And I'm sure that there's a lot of takeaways that people will have from this conversation. And uh, I one of the next thing you have been writing on Andaman for long, and we just keep hope uh, we you know we, we hope that you keep doing so. 
in the long uh, days to come. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Thanks Sashwat, so much. For yeah. Can I also thank the Azim Prem University, Shubir and Shashwat and the entire team for giving me this op uh, platform and uh, I, it's been fascinating to talk to both of you. Thank you so much. Also, thank you. Thank you. And hopefully, uh, whoever joined also had a good time. And uh, I'd invite all of you to, if you want to, I'd be happy to receive from you. Uh, you can write to me. My email is uh, p with my surname p a c k h s a r i a at gmail dot com. Uh, I'd, 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 I'd be very happy to hear back from you and with your ideas and thoughts and uh, anything else. So thank you very much again, everybody, and uh, bye bye and take care. Take thank you. Thank you. Thank you for. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you for being with us, and thank you, everyone. See you next time on the next yeah. uh, webinar of Nature Writing for Children. Thank you so much. Everyone. Thank you. Bye.